All right. So I'm trying to think. I first met you at our first Beyond Basketball meeting in October, Liz. And I remember you telling me, calling me to the side and just telling me all of the things that you had done, even being here mm -hmm. as an assistant coach. And I had no idea. So why don't you tell our audience who you are and just your path a little bit, and then we'll get into some deeper questions as it relates to Title IX and just your journey. Okay. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Galloway McQuitter, and I was born and raised right up the street in Rockdale, Texas. Uh, my journey took me long, a long way from home. Um, I went to Temple Junior College and went from there to UNLV, graduated from there, and went to, on to play in the first women's professional basketball league, the WBL, in Chicago. Uh, myself, like so many of us, went into coaching, and I had a 32-year coaching experience. And uh, along the way in Aggie Land, I coached with uh, Coach Gillum for five years. And uh, after that, I went and coached in back to my hometown and coached. And now I'm a semi-retired semi educator, and I'm president of an organization called Legends of the Ball, Inc. And our mission is to promote the historic and social relevance of the WBL. Right. So that's what's brought us here today. So let's get mm -hmm. into that. Before Title IX, what did sports look like for you and the other women in your area? Um, and what barriers were there? Before Title IX, um, girls basketball in Texas was big. Iowa, I think you could say, was the state for girls basketball. They had their own division. They're, they were unrivaled, I think. Oklahoma, places like that. Then you could go to several other board members up north in Illinois and Kansas. They didn't have access to that. But we always had the opportunity to play. So playing basketball was, there were no obstacles at that time to playing. And when you're in it, I don't think you realize what you don't have because you're just enjoying it and having fun. So Title IX came along in 1972. We were in high school, had no idea what Title IX was, had no idea what it would mean to us or what we would mean to it. So by the time I got to Temple Junior College, Francis Garman, who's a Hall of Famer, one of the preeminent people for the WBCA, one of the founding members of the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame, and still on the board and still out there promoting women's basketball, enlightened us and told us what the opportunities and what it would mean. So by the time I transferred from Temple uh, to the UNLV, we became the first scholarship athletes to receive, uh, the first student athletes to receive scholarships for women's basketball. Wow. And not only that, Peggy Gillum, with whom you met before, who was the coach here prior to Coach Blair, was the first African-American player at Ole Miss. Mm -hmm. Retha Swindell on our board was the first African-American player at Texas. And uh, we have on our board uh, Trish Roberts, was the first African-American woman to play for Pat Summit at in Tennessee's first All-American. Uh, Adrian Mitchell Newell at the University of Kansas um, was one of the first African-Americans to receive a scholarship at Kansas. And then D.K. Thomas at Stephen F. Austin, Molly Bolin at Grandview. And um, I think in Charlene McCorda Jackson, our lone HBCU member <laughs> at Albany State in Georgia. So what happened is we became a generation of firsts. No, not the first to play the game, but the first to receive those scholarships at our respective universities. Wow. How many, um, and then I'm going to ask you about Peggy a little bit, but how mm -hmm. many um, received scholarships with you at UNLV? How many were there that first year? Our whole roster. And which was there, there 12? Was 12. 12. Wow. Mm -hmm. Actually, we had uh, two walk-ons. But there were 10 of us that received athletic scholarships. So we were that first class to mm -hmm. receive athletic scholarships at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. They had only had a program one year before, and it was mostly like walk-ons, just kind of structured. You know, usually the women who were the PE teachers took over the teams before, you know, right. the actual coaches came in, and that's, mm -hmm. that was the case. So Dan Ayala, and I have to speak his name because he was with Jerry Tarkanian of the Running Rebels. He came over from the men and took over the women's program and quickly turn oh, that yeah. program around. Wow. Mm -hmm. No, um, Peggy Gillum recruited me. I'm from Meridian, she Mississippi, me. right? Yes. And so Peggy recruited me when she was working with Van Chancellor at Ole Miss. And mm -hmm. so obviously her playing at Ole Miss, me being from Mississippi, that's a name that was just renowned for yes, me. The along Gillums. with the Gillums sisters <laughs> and Delta State. I mean, all yes. you know, so there was a lot of rich tradition and history for Absolutely. me growing up. But to 
to to follow Peggy's journey and then to know that I still have her now Mm -hmm. as a mentor and somebody she was at our game this past Sunday she traveled with Ole Miss so she's someone who I figured (laughs) I figured you guys connected so um just that's those names just those women are so you guys are so powerful even now just what you've done for our sport so well I think the biggest one of the messages that we try to put out is that we never went away we never left the game Mm -hmm. and coaching there's over 1500 years of coaching among our wbl group wow among our board members only we have over 150 years of coaching i coached 32 years 30 30 25 26 years of coaching among our group and i think the important thing to know is that where were we where did we go we've been there growing the game we've coached collegians we've coached wnba players peggy coached in the Mm -hmm. wnba trish coached in the abl Uh, We were instrumental in the first four women's professional basketball leagues. People don't realize, not only do they not know the WBL was the first, they don't recognize the ones that followed all the way up to the ABL ABL, and then the WNBA. Mm -hmm. There were nine. And that is not even counting the ones who attempted and never got recognized. You have to acknowledge everybody that chipped away, chipped away, chipped away at the mountain until you have a league that's 26 years and running. Wow. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. Um, So you had an incredible college career that helped Mm -hmm. lead you to the WBL. Mm -hmm. When you were playing in the first ever professional women's basketball game in the U.S., did you realize in that moment how important it was? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, We came out in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in a crowd of about 8,000 curious fans, and I think they were coming to see what this product was. There were two products on on debut, the women themselves and the smaller ball that we debuted. Both delivered. And we knew what we were doing. And our it was so much bigger than us. And we were savvy enough to know that if we made this succeed, mm-hmm. boy, we would have a women's pro league and other girls would be able to look up and and play professional basketball. And but for a few missteps, it might be the WBL instead of the WNBA. Wow. How long did you guys practice with the new ball before you, you roll it out? This is a, there are a lot of funny stories, and I think all the women can tell you the funny stories. A lot of bricks, a lot of overshooting, a lot <laughs> yeah. of undershooting, just trying to adjust because we played with the regulation ball that the men the played men, with. That's right. what we grew up playing mm-hmm. with. And it was just a, 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 an adjustment, you know, over the summer and in the fall. And I'll tell you, Karen Logan, who designed that ball, Wilson produced the ball, um, her, her message was all the other sports alter their women's equipment. Golf, bowling, softball, um, what other sport is there? The tennis racket. So why wouldn't you do the same? It doesn't mean that you're not a skilled athlete. Right. She envisioned a game that would be faster, the ball handling would be better, the passing would be better, the game would be faster, and the shooting would be better range Mm -hmm. couldn't shoot with the regulation ball you couldn't magically shoot with this one but everything she envisioned happened the foresight you women had is just unbelievable Mm -hmm. I mean I I knew a lot of this but I'm Mm -hmm. learning even listening to you now and I just Mm -hmm. keep thinking of like what foresight sometimes in the moment you're just trying to survive or you're just fighting but you guys were so meticulous about thinking through every piece of this I'll tell you what led to that for me coming in high school when when high school was over and uh, was about to end I was sad oh I don't get to play anymore God, the title nine came along so now we have the opportunity to take our basketball ability or sport, all the women in sports and get a college scholarship but it was always about the education mm-hmm. when we were coming to the end of our senior years in college oh my goodness we, it's over it's over the WBL comes along. What? We get a chance to play women's professional basketball? So it's something to be a trailblazer. I don't think you are always aware that you're you're a trailblazer. And I think there were moments we were definitely aware and made aware, became aware mm-hmm. that we were blazing a trail. Mm-hmm. It was always bigger than us. It reminds me of um, the year that the WNBA was in the bubble. And that mm-hmm. was such a pivotal, you know, year um, for – for the election and just for politics in general and not to become political, but you could just tell they were very aware 
of what they were doing in the yes. platform they had. I can and relate took to advantage that. of it. You could, you know, you could watch that from afar and know that they realized the impact they were going to have. I can so relate to that. Mm -hmm. And we felt a part of that. And I think one thing that's so important for the women, and I say this all the time, it's so important for us to go back and connect the dots. Because a lot of times when you think you're first or you think you're making uh, the impact, somebody's already done it or somebody's paved the way for you. So when we say promote the social and historic relevance of right. what we did, we showed the world that women could play professional basketball or women could play sports and be successful and be good at it. And the social change that we brought about in the 70s, mm -hmm. you know, we were out there making changes, maybe not in that manner or protesting what they were protesting, but by example and by being excellent. We knew it was important to be excellent, to put a, an excellent product on the floor because there were so many naysayers. Right. And they come out there and, oh, what is this going to be, like a circus? They just came to see. And Chicago in particular is a sports town. And Doug Bruno was our coach, who's still coaching right now at DePaul, was this young, fiery coach of the hustle. And uh, we're, so now we're competing with the Bears and the Bulls, pre-Michael Jordan, of course. But we're out drawing the Blackhawks on WGN, which were one of, the few on one of two teams that were televised. And they came to see, and what they saw was a good product. Mm -hmm. Wow. So um, after your pro career, you went into coaching and finished your career, coach, college career here at A&M. Mm -hmm. What have you seen change in Aggieland um, from your time to coaching to now? I don't think much has changed in Aggieland as far as the support. I mean, we know they love their sports. We know they support them. Um, I, I love how they've embraced you. We embraced you. Peggy and I talked about you when you got hired for the position. We knew Coach Blair. You know, mm -hmm. I've known Coach Blair when I was a player. So we, we knew him for a long time. I've always supported. I, I was at Rockdale. I always brought my girls to the games. We came to the camps which will be back. Uh, I don't, I'm not coaching anymore, but I have some little youngsters I can bring here. So to me, the, the, they've always been supportive. They've always embraced uh, the women's basketball team. And I'm, I'm loving the way they're embracing you and you're becoming and all of your philosophy. I'm excited for you. And I can't wait till you get your full roster and get out there and, and get a couple of recruiting years mm -hmm. under your belt. And I think they'll be excited to see what's coming. I am. Thank you. We are, too. That was one mm -hmm. of the things when we were, you know, considering coming here and making the decision is obviously being on the other side of, you know, being an opponent, you could see just the genuine support. Yes. Nothing every time. like playing here. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. Right. And so to now be on the same side of that and to feel it, that mm -hmm. is definitely, definitely yeah. true. Yeah. Definitely but true. I mean, there's, there's no, there, it's a place like no other. Mm -hmm. Did you ever think young girls and women would have the opportunities they have now when you talk about like name, image, likeness, the facilities, yeah. all of the cost of attendance, all the things that are available now? Did you know that was coming? I knew change was coming. I knew growth was coming. I knew um, access and pri the privilege and the opportunities. I knew all that was coming. I don't think I anticipated, anticipated the depth and breadth of it. Yeah. You know, but I mean, it's glad to see the one thing and we will always promote this is connect the dots. Somebody opened a door for you. Mm -hmm. And if there's one thing that we really would like to see them do, the women do, the men do a better job of it. I mean, they can connect the dots back. They honor uh, their trailblazers and pioneers. You you could see the great late Bill Russell sitting courtside at the mm -hmm. All-Star Games and Dr. J and all these young guys they, they knew who they were and they knew not just Kobe and Michael they right. went all the way back to the 75 years well women's professional basketball isn't 26 years old it's going it's going to be 45 years old this year and we were the first and honor everybody in between Essie one of your players mom played in in Waba which was three leagues after the WBL mm -hmm. so you have to honor everybody that that played a part in knocking down that door and giving the opportunities Wow. So with that being said, you took the first steps for women in sports in this country. What are the next steps and who needs to take them? I think the next steps, and I, I'm not, I'm really not grabbing this opportunity to preach about history, but in a way I am, <laughs> because I think the next step is for them to connect the dots and understand the growth and their history. How can you tell 
How can you know how far you've come or where you're going if you don't know where it began? Mm -hmm. What's your measuring stick? How can you gauge it? You can't. So I would say go back and gauge, truly gauge, especially in this 50th anniversary of Title IX year, truly gauge how far the game has come. Because if you're just going back only to here, it will There's be- a lot we're missing. You'll be missing it. It'll be omissive. It won't be inclusive. And that's not fair mm -hmm. to those who came. We know who came before us and we honor them, you know? And so I, that, would be, that would be my wish for, for the, the current players. And once you connect the dots, I think you will carry that baton with a different perspective. Well, Liz, thank you so very much. You're um, welcome. Thank I'm you. so glad that I have you here. I'm um, here <laughs> whenever you need anything. Yep. So we appreciate you. And just in this year of, of the 50th anniversary of Title IX and all the celebrations, thank you so much for all that you have done. Thank you, Joan. And all that you continue and to do. And thank for you our for sport. what you're doing moving it forward. Thank you.